Hey, everybody. It's Larry Berman here. It's uh, an unusual recording on a Thursday night, only because I'm yet in another golf tournament, if you can't tell by the red uh, golfer's face that I have and, and golfer's tan that I have. Anyways, uh, enough about that. So Thursday night, we had a um, statement that came out from, um, or rumors uh that the uh, Bank of Japan was going to change their yield curve control policy. So let's dig into the chart room and, and look at some of the price behavior from Thursday. Normally we do these things late on Friday and I just won't be around. Uh, I'll be on the golf course, uh, hopefully winning winning some, some cash this week. Um, actually playing in the Oakdale uh, member guest uh, golf fans in Canada will know Oakdale is where they had the uh, Canadian Open this year. So pretty excited to uh, to be at that venue. Okay, let's have a look at the charts. So S&P 500 gapped uh, open. Uh, Meta earnings came out uh, after the close on Wednesday. This is the volatility price behavior um, uh, after the FOMC. So Powell started speaking. Um, to 30 for initial Fed statement, not much, and then the press conference. So, you know, Powell kind of said in the press conference uh, right around here when he was asked about, you know, tightening versus easing and the probability of rate hikes and pretty much, I think, set in the FOMC's mind that there's going to be at least one more rate hike, if not more. And it seems to be based on the, the tone of his remarks that they're more inclined to do more and, and bring the economy down. And while they'd love a soft landing, they, they recognize the labor uh, situation is still very, very strong. Thursday, we got claims numbers again, really, really low. And, and you know, next week, of course, non-farm payrolls, uh, pretty important. But let's center in on, on uh, government debt because there's where you see on Thursday the uh, rumored announcement that the Bank of Japan was going to be, again, modifying their yield curve control. When the lowest interest rate in the world has been anchored for decades and they're going to change that policy, everything gets you know, priced off the most expensive thing or the cheapest thing, depending on what market you're looking at. So in this case, Japanese government bonds being the cheapest. And so if their yields are going to rise, then German bonds are going to rise and treasuries are going to rise and so forth. So we saw that that started to impact the equity markets, because when you look at valuation, uh, and you take a discount of future cash flows, the more expensive those future cash flows are, the, the, the lower the valuation. Last uh, week, we saw an update, uh, and I think it's a little over $1.1 trillion in this year's uh, fiscal budget for the U.S. is going to be interest cost. Roll back pre-COVID, and that number was 350 billion. So the rise in interest rates is making it more expensive for taxpayers. And that just sucks a bunch of money uh, out of productive spending, I, in other words, out of the economy, and is going to be the biggest issue for, you know, as far as you want to think about it. Now, next week, of course, the last of the big tech names. Apple reports. And as you look at the uh, chart and behavior on Apple, it, it's no different on the Thursday. Again, market sells off, Apple comes off. If we look at the chart here, you, you do get the sense of um, that, that we're really extended here. Um, again, fundamentals, earnings, Apple's expensive here. Many will argue it's not. That's fine. Uh, AI and all that, whatever. Um, you know, 22, 25, 
fine. So if a seven multiple comes off this stock, um, you know, you're, you're looking at not maybe an eight multiple, you're looking at a 25% of the price coming off. So again, Apple in the low 100s, 120, 125, there's value there. There, there just isn't here. Um, so let's have a look at um, a couple other things right now. So on Monday, the 31st, we're going to get the announcement of the um, size of the budget, or the size of the deficit financing that's needed. So, you know, you have this core amount, which is, you know, bonds maturing, and then you have new debt. And when you look at the deficit, it's it's the new debt that, that's the key thing. But at the same time, you've got the Fed maturing bonds off their balance sheet because they want to shrink it. And when you throw that all into the mix for the next quarter, the estimate is around 540 billion. So that number is going to get uh, a fit be, become official on July 31st. On August 2nd, we get the plan from the Treasury on how they're going to finance this. So there's a committee, there's an advisory committee, TBAC, um, and it stands for the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee. It consists of members of all the banks and dealers that uh, are responsible for making markets and auctioning uh, and buying that debt. Um, and they all get together and they say, this is what it should be. And then the Treasury does what they want to do. Historically, let's look at some numbers here and you get a sense of what the mix is. Tip of the hat to our friend Andy Constant, uh, Damp Springs, must follow on Twitter. Uh, you gotta, you gotta listen to this guy. He, he's one of the top guys out there that understands treasury financing, flow of funds, and ultimately what the, how that translates into valuation of equity markets. I started following Andy about three years ago, and it's just been incredible value added to the investment process. So, you know, COVID comes, yeah, you had a lot of debt that they needed to finance. Uh, so this red bar is, is total debt. Uh, obviously, they was they started to run into the budget ceiling and there, there was debt that they really couldn't finance. Um, so how they finance it bills and bonds and that mix historically is around 80 percent coupon in other words duration risk versus 20 percent treasury bills that's about the mix historically you could see in the last refunding the last quarter that uh, madame yellen decided to refund the treasury general account they needed um, uh, about 700 billion, the vast majority of that with bills. In fact, the last quarter and the quarter before that, bills. When they do it with bills, it's negating the pressure of QT. So as the Fed was shrinking their balance sheet, effectively, they were throwing that all into money markets. And you got this massive buildup in excess reserves and, and so forth. But if it's coupon risk, you, you've got interest rate risk coming into the marketplace. And based right now on the term premium or the shape of the yield curve, you're not getting compensated adequately with all this tremendous bond supply coming forever into the future because they're never going to be able to balance the budget again. Uh, is going to put pressure on risk assets as yields rise. And so Andy's forecasting that the mix this time around, which we find out, again, quarterly refunding announcement August 2nd, biggest event of the week. Nobody talks about it. It's not on anybody's calendar, but it matters for markets because of what's happening and the dynamic of the massive deficits. So again, total about 540 billion. The mix is gonna be about equal. The more this green bar, the more coupons they do, the more they're signaling to the marketplace they're gonna normalize and over the next few quarters, get back to the more historic 80-20 mix 
like was in here, like was in here, and so forth. And that is going to put pressure over the next 12 months minimum on yields. The higher yields go, the less, val the, the, the less valuable risk assets are, and ultimately uh, risk premiums go up. And that means the stock multiple comes down. So let's get back into the chart room and see what that ultimately may mean for the S&P 500. So here's our chart of the S&P from, from high to low, back to high this week. Um, we're not quite at a double top, but we're, we're getting extremely, extremely close. There's no real technical point here on the chart that you one could argue, because we've gone through previous highs, um, that, you know, it's a reversal, it's resistance or anything until you get to the old highs. And technically, we, we could still do that. The important thing here, if you're looking at a daily chart, you know, a reversal pattern like that. We saw a little bit of indication last week, no follow through. Saw an indication here, no follow through. Saw an indication here, no follow through. Let's have a look at the weekly chart because it's the weeklies that give us that better sense of higher high and higher low. So banking crisis, lower low, lower low, lower low, lower low. But ever since, we really have not had a weekly closing low below the prior week's low, with the exception of this week here in May. And as we saw, very low week, didn't take out the previous week's low. It just had a modest close lower. We need to see the behavior in the weekly chart start to change, where the market, with relative ease, closes below the previous week's low. So what's that level that we're looking at? Again, by the time you see this, we'll know the answer. I don't know it today, but the low of last week on the S the previous week on the S and P 500, 4504.8999. So if we close below basically 4500, we're looking at a confirmed weekly reversal. And when you tend to get those confirmed weekly reversals with the closing low below the prior low you tend to get follow through on the downside. Where are the immediate targets we would look for? Somewhere around where resistance was in the 4,200 level would be at a minimum where we would expect the markets to correct to. What needs to happen for that? On August 2nd, Janet says we're gonna do a lot more coupons than the market was ready for and risk premiums need to expand. I know it was a long one this week, folks, but Really, a lot of meat there to digest. No bull and bear pick of the week. Caution, caution, caution. Our Berman's Call Pro Eyes Index is flashing the highest cautionary numbers that we have seen in a couple of years. So there's a lot of indications here that risk factors are really, really high. Do with it what you will, but we're building a lot of defense into our portfolios for clients. Have a great week, everyone.